morning, everybody. Welcome to our presentation for today. I'm just going to hang on and wait for just a couple more participants and then we'll get going. So I did have a dream last night that the tech went completely wrong and everyone had to endure an episode of Neighbours. So if at any point we start looking very sun-kissed and speaking in an Australian accent, we know it's all gone wrong. But um, I'm sure that won't happen. So just a couple more moments and then we'll get cracking. Okay. Right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm just going to give you a few points about housekeeping. So um, this is a webinar and it's being recorded today. So it's going to be available on our Vimeo channel and our website from next week. Um, I hope the sounds okay. I hope you can all hear me okay. Please do make a comment if the sounds not great in the chat box or the Q&A box. And likewise, we've got a panel of speakers today. So we have five speakers who will all be speaking one after the other. If you have any questions at all, please use the Q&A and the chat facility. And we'll answer those questions at the end after all our speakers have been. Um, if there's any um, questions that we don't get through, then we'll certainly um, take note of these and we can always pass them on afterwards. So let's see how we do for time. So right, let's get cracking. So my name's um, Amy Hesp. I'm the development officer for the south of Scotland for Community Land Scotland. Um, I'm not sure about the speakers and their journeys, but um, since I've been in this role eight weeks, I feel like I've really been on my own quite eye-opening and inspiring journey. Um, just looking at all the initiatives that are taking place in the South is uh, quite phenomenal. And what's being achieved is um, pretty outstanding, to be honest. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from our speakers later to get more detail on just a few of those that are taking place because there is a lot happening in the region. Um, so that's partly why in around 2016, uh, Community Land Scotland really wanted to put a bit more resource into the South and support all the initiatives that are taking place and start really promoting what's going on and, and really kind of building the movement in, in the region. So um, it's been really fantastic and I'm looking forward to kind of connecting and building stronger networks out there with all our members and potential members and people who are going through the community land or asset journey. So um, really that leads us on to our, our first speaker and um, I'd like to introduce um, Greg Cuthbert, who's from the Newcastleton and District Community Trust. And following Greg, we will then have um, Hazel, Hazel Smith, who's the founder of Retweed. Following Hazel, we've got Stacey Bradley from the South of Scotland Community Housing. Then we've got Margaret Poole from the Langham Initiative. And finally, but not least, we've got um, Alan Thompson from the Annan Harbour Action Group. So we'll kick off with uh, Greg. So over to you, Greg. I'll get going, I'll be going. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thanks, Greg. Great. Sorry about that. Yeah, the first slide just shows a, 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 the south portion of our little village. Uh, and and uh, you can see a little bit of forestry encroachment into that land. Uh, so this is the Home Hill Community Buyer, our story. Uh, if we could have the next slide, please, Amy. That shows you where we are. A little bit on the map, how uh, we're at very south of the, the Scottish borders and the, maybe the Sousa area, the Sousa area, uh, you know, and uh, what we like to think is a beautiful part of the country, but a little bit of a forgotten part of the country. So, again, Newcastle and sets of stones through away from the border between Scotland and England. 
as remote a place as can be as can be. We're a landlocked island. We've always felt that. We've got limited public transport, no real future employment opportunities. A challenging 50 mile round trip to school for our secondary school pupils puts many off going and going at a further, ed further education. We've got a low attainment education, education here, and it's a real, real worry. Uh, add in the aging demographics of our, our village, as you can see in the top right hand corner, you know, we, we're faced with a problem that in a few years' time, that the majority of this village will be people will be pensioners. So we've always been trying to to, to, to solve that problem. Uh, attracting retirees to come and live here is easy, but attracting people to come and work is very difficult. The community trust faced faced trying to way for trying to find ways of improving this. We were you know, we started a long long time ago and and. We first started with the petrol pumps, which we managed to, to succeed and opened a, a new petrol, community petrol station. We're working on Baclou House. But when this came along, it was a, an opportunity we couldn't miss. Since 1969, when the beaching cuts came, closed the waiver line, the decline in population, employment, investment, ever increasing demand on local services, which continue to face cuts. In line with all other public sector provisions, We've also experienced dramatic and relatively rapid environmental changes due to the climate change. Our the flooding of Storm Dennis back in, to, in February devastated the village. And in the last 20 years, we've had three other floods which, has, which have caused damage to infrastructure, to housing, and various other, various other village aspects of life, you know. We've only got 450 houses, 110 of those were flooded during this. So in February of that year, we were at probably at our lowest ebb. But then, amazingly, if I could have the next slide, please, Amy. Is it there? Yeah. The Sables brochure came out and the opportunity for us to try and own some of Home Hill and Taras Water. Now, this was totally unexpected. Uh, it was, it was, you know, we read it first of all, I think, in the paper, and you know, soon after we 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 met. In fact, it was that day we met and decided that you know we had to get everybody together quickly. We talked about the potential threat this might bring if others came along and owned it. Forestry grants are prevalent. And we've already got to contend with large commercial sites, as you see in the first picture, that are encroaching onto us. The land had also been part of a much debate study called the, the Demonstration Road Project. As a, as a result of this, the experiment of all the livestock was removed and the land allowed to neutralise, to naturalise, sorry. Over the 12 years of the project, the landscape changed dramatically, dramatically with rushes, heather, now rife. Land jobs were lost and groundsmen and gamekeepers let go. This land was viable farming land and, and that kept us sustained and many others sustained. Indeed, it was 200 years ago that we first came to this ground and tilled it and farmed it. But gradually, as what happened in many places, we were moved off it by the Duke so we could create the village that we live in now. As a result of these endeavours, we became a community and we never thought we'd have this chance as a community to buy that land again, to even have that land again as our own. Could I have the next slide, please, uh, Amy? If it comes up, there we are. That shows you uh, an, uh, the area of, of the land that was Border Estate were selling. We are the, the, the yellow patch, the sort of mark patch in the far right side. You know, we live, we lived in the village and we farmed the home hill, leasing the lands from the estate to graze their cattle and sheep. They were taken from the buyers at the rear of houses up to the hill each day. They would just go themselves and they would come back down at the end of the day. They, they, I mean, the cattle knew their way to each house. You know, that's how simple life was in our village. And, and it was still happening in the 1960s. However, that was then, and this is now, and although it sounds romantic and, and uh, we make a lovely film, Making a living where we live is hard work. Allowing someone to dictate our future once again was not something we really wanted to contemplate. 
So our discussions came to a firm conclusion. We wanted the time to consider a community buyout. The Home Hill land may still be farmed and land which may be considered good commercial land can be used to try and regenerate this village. A wider meeting was called with the Community Council, Community Trust and Business Forum, as well as farmers, village elders and, and lots of others. We met and decided that we needed to investigate an action and an, an action plan was formed. Number four, Amy, I think, I think it is our next chart, next, next one yet. So how we approached the sale, we, we had all the community groups, uh, we prepared the groundwork, sought the funding, uh, quickly got to grips with the challenges of doing something like this by asking others and talking to many who had been through these types of things and, and luckily found some great experts to help us. And we had to get stuck in, you know. Uh, we'd had a little bit of, of luck in, in previously been offered some leisure assets that were within the village from Baclou. So we were, we were with a good start. Could I have a next uh, mark, please, Amy? That, the, the areas in pink, show areas within the village that Baclou had offered us quite a few years ago. But we also bought some ground off from way back in, in 1925 when we, we actually bought Baclou House, from, uh, which is our main building in the village, for £325, a considerable sum back then. So we've always worked with Baclou. The, 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 the areas in pink were things like the, the park, the football field, uh, tennis courts and woodland walks. So, you know, it was imperative that we acted quickly. We, we decided that this was our chance. We thought we'd never come. To change the lives of the community and the direction of the village was heading in. For years, we've been stifled. We could not build, we could not re-energize. We were locked in our small parcel of ground with the water on one side and the home hill on the other. In our 225 year history of the village, Newcastle was really no better. And this is true than an Indian reservation in the plains of the Old West. And that was written about many, many years ago. We were left behind in a forgotten place. This was our chance to change, to offer hope to a brighter future, to take control of our destiny and not be holding to the others, to others, to create a program and reinvig reinvigorate our community, attracting inward investment, employment, and jobs to keep our young families and attract others, to overcome fuel poverty and poor housing stock, to create a community not social isolated, left out on a limb, but one that had a future built at our pace to serve the people who live and work here, leaving no one behind, building a legacy for our grandchildren so that they could live better, more sustainable lives than we do. Owning land would enable us to do that. This is what it means to us. What next? Budgets were secured to undertake investigated work, develop a mixed use strategy for the land, but one that was not financial, a financial burden on the community. We were realistic in our ambition. The team spent many sleepless nights with unanswered questions. What shall we do with this and this bit and that bit? Can we do this with this bit? Shall we plant trees to bring in income? Were we mad not to, to take on so much? What happens if we fail? But in the end, we worked through all these obstacles and we answered all the questions and we came up with a plan. We decided on the catchment area needed, 750 acres, and asked to see the estate to negotiate the deal. Our land valuer and our land, and the land valuer expected to dance around with our handbags, but it was not like that. We expected to be uh, in, in some you know, really tough negotiations with Baclou, but Baclou came back and were excellent again with this and agreed to our offer. And that was it. Simple as, we, we can have no complaints about the clue, but I think a lot of that went down to our land agents and some of the experts that we had and the ideas that the village had and the passion, and honestly, the passion in the, community, the passion in the community to own this land again, just shone through any time anybody from the estate uh, visited, you know. If you go on, uh, I think it's number, next uh, slide, please, Amy. We had a, a community engagement and uh, we called it a new dawn for Newcastle. And these were some of the things we planned. Renewables, mountain bike trails, new walks, you know, a new golf club, new golf club house, uh, which will incorporate our dark skies, you know, stargazing galaxies, guy glazing pods and a glamping area, you know, the wigwam type things. All these things 
walks again into the a replant or rosy wood that was a was a, had been uh, replanted with uh, indigenous trees, you know, uh, and, and, and you know, things that wouldn't be over overriding in the village like sick spruce does, and bring back some farming, you know. We spent much of the time talking to the community to seek food feedback during the process. And then, as I say, we hosted an open day so that everyone could come and see the vision. You know, we asked everyone what they thought and they told us, go for it. Over 90% of our community want us, wanted us to buy the hill. Then the hardest part of all started, sorting the funding and the detail of the deal. Fine tuning the boundaries, checking the fencing, buildings that we did and did not want. What were the liabilities if we took them on? Where could new access areas be found to make the land more viable for other uses? Much discussion, much, much debate and learning. And the community had worked closely with the Scottish Land Fund since 2014, when we bought a derelict site to build our community unmanned fuel pumps. This process had taught us much and we knew that what was expected, but Scottish Land Fund are there to help, not just to judge applications and awarded grants. They do not spoon feed you, you must do everything yourself, but they'll listen and guide you and bring you back on track when you get carried away, which you can. Blue sky thinking is easy, when you do not have to pay for it. Raising large capital sums in a short time is not easy and could not be done, sorry, is not easy. Raising, raising large capital sums in a short time is not easy and not an easy thing. And this was too many impossible. Lots shook their head and said it could not be done. But if enough of you believe and have a realistic ambition, then anything is possible. As a community, we are lucky that we have had a vision of what we could achieve. We knew our land, its strengths, its weaknesses. Within a short time, we'd mapped out our future, a future that will make this community sustainable, improve the lives of many. We have plans to reduce fuel, fuel, reduce fuel poverty, increase educational attainment, which is imperative, provide lands for new housing, offering hope to new start young farmers and smallholders again to use the land as always was. In a little over 12 months, we managed to achieve what many really did not, did not think was possible. 700 acres of land is not a huge amount, but for the people of Liddesdale, it is their lifeblood. It is the land where our families stood on, we tilled it, we farmed it, we played on it, we swam in it, in our rivers. It's their lifeblood. It's a very humbling experience having this happen. The community were absolutely behind this. Those with reservations quickly changed their minds when they saw the vision presented at the community consultation and the potential that owning the hill offers us. From solar farms to dark sky, mountain biking to farming. It's been a journey of frustration, education, frustration at some of the pitfalls and regulations that seem to hamper rather than help, education in the fact that you learn quickly to network, to use as many knowledgeable and experienced people you know for free if you can, which we did. But during the whole process, make sure that you carry the whole community. This is a huge, huge thing to anybody trying to do this. You must have the community behind you which makes it so much easier to convince any doubting funders and politicians when the time comes to ask for the cash. Christmas 2019 was bloody hard work and it was, and getting the submission ready for January deadline to the land fund felt at times like a, an insurmountable mountain to climb. It was a huge relief when the paperwork went off, but a terrifying waiting game of chicken and mouse end ensued. SL, SLF asked us to move the bid, sadly. They'd run out of cash and that was a big blow. All the large applications were to be reviewed at the same time. We felt this was grossly unfair as we'd worked so hard and we'd also signed a memorandum of understanding with Reclue relating to the deadline. So it was not just a rollover situation to us, it was devastating blow of potentially we could lose our chance. As it happened, we did not have time to dwell on, them, on those matters because Storm Kira hit, followed by Storm Dennis. We we're four foot underwater and had to fight for our homes and our lives. Water flew, flowed through our village at speeds of 30, mile, 30 miles an hour. Babies were passed out of windows. It was utterly terrifying for many of those involved. When the pandemic hit we were, and we were in lockdown, the community was still cleaning up after Stennis. Life just got busier and even more challenging. Looking after 120 individuals who were on the shielding list, rehoming people who had been flooded. The home hill was put in the back burner. It was a bright light that flickered, but did not flame. We had too much to contend with. Our community was broken, it really was and needing fixing. So we just got on with fixing the community. Then we got a call out of the blue. We previously had chats with SLF, answering questions about our application, but it all felt like it was taking ages and no decisions were imminent. 
as everything had stalled because of COVID. We are spe speechless and dumbfounded and jubilant, still are actually. We have not yet had the chance to celebrate because of COVID, but we will, and we'll have a hell of a party. For others hoping to achieve what we have, it's usually important you have the confidence of the funders. You keep the landowner informed and your community backs you. Ultimately, ultimately that your plans are sound and sustainable over a long term for the future for future generations. We are, as I said, at the beginning, at the beginning, a landlocked island, but now we have been given a chance to make the Liddesdale Valley a destination place, not somewhere you pass through on your journey. This is a community with a once in a lifetime chance to change its future. And we intend to use the home hill to help us do that. It will not happen overnight, but it will happen. Up until now, Newcastleton is a village in which my grandparents and parents had more chances and more opportunities than my grandchildren. And that is a true story, that is true. But if you have a little passion burning inside about what you think has been an, in an injustice and an, 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 an abandonment over the years, it makes you work all the harder to create change. This again would not have happened without so said, the Scottish Government. But this is about people. The Newcastle and buyout is about people, plain and simple. We need this, we need this land, we needed this buyout to survive. Because as the demographics showed you at the very beginning, if we'd not had the ability to do this and change, we wouldn't even had the people here to care for our elderly in 20 or 25 years time. Our population had dropped from about 1,300 people to 762 since the beaching cuts and the railway closed in 1970. We were forgotten, completely forgotten by many. And there is many, there is many who should shoulder little bits of blame for this, ourselves for allowing this to happen. Uh, various government bodies down the years who thought that rural communities were maybe not as important as our towns and cities. The socio and, e and economic problems that Newcastle and face, in my mind, are still greater than any deprived city centre area. You know, we, we, our, our children have nothing. They have absolutely nothing. They cannot travel to see their friends. There is no public transport. They cannot do any after school activities. There is nothing for them. As we said during my, my, when I was talking, the attainment at school, uh, of secondary school, is, is breathtaking that nothing serious has ever been done about it. You know, we are the only ones that can change that now by, by giving our children a better life. This is for them. This is for my grandchildren. This is for other people's children. This is about people. This is about my people, people who I love, and people who have supported us for this last five or six years in trying to, to change your lives and who are crucial, absolutely crucial in us making this, this buyout happen. You know, if Baclou had never seen the passion that we have in this village to make our lives better and to prove so many people wrong, that this, this, this little village will be the centre of the borderlands, it will be the centre of Soset. We can offer so much economically to this country, you know, and, and we will make that happen. Newcastleton will be a driver for other small rural communities to look at and say, we want a part of this, we want this to happen. And I urge anyone out there who wants to, to dictate and have a say in their own lives and their children's lives, grasp any chance you have to do something like this because there is no cavalry coming over the hill, like Boris says, to, for us. We have to reach out to SOSEP, we have to reach out, and we have to force them to help us. And they are willing now to help us. We are, we are in a good position because of the people who now realize the south of Scotland badly needs regenerized and it needs help. And I'd just like to thank you for that, for this opportunity, and, and invite any of you to come to Newcastle and, and see how beautiful an area we live in and, and what, what we can achieve with your help. If you have the courage to help us go and, and, and further fund the plans we've got, we'll not let you down, I promise you. Thank you. 
Great, thank you so much for that. Um, you can really feel the passion there. And um, I think what stood out for me is, you know, like you were saying, the strong vision and knowing the land um, and really wanting to tackle those key issues with the community, like, that really comes across. So thank you for your time, Greg, that was great. Thanks, you're very, you're very welcome. You, know, you really are. It's a, it's a great opportunity to try and, and put a story up. I'm, I'm just a village lad. There's some far, far brighter people than me that have made this happen. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm the one who's, I'm, I'm, we're all passionate about it, but it burns in me. I don't see any injustice to my grandchildren and children, which has been. You know, I'm going to make their lives better if it's the last thing I do. You know, I am. Thanks, Greg. Thanks. Okay, so. Um, Cheers, thank you very much. After that, we're moving on to um, Hazel Smith from Retweed. So um, over to you, Hazel. Hi, good morning, everybody. I don't know who's all out there, but um, good morning. And uh, thanks, Amy and others from Community Land Scotland for giving me the opportunity to talk about our organisation. I'm going to share screen if I may, yes, Amy? May I? Yeah, please go ahead, Hazel. That's great. Right. Okay, I am Hazel Smith. I am the founder of an organisation based in the Scottish borders, based in Eyemouth, right on the other side from where uh, Greg was a wee while ago in Newcastleton. So we are on the very bottom east uh, edge of Scotland. And like Newcastleton, we often fall off the map of Scotland. Um, I set up a social enterprise for almost five years ago now called Retweed. It is a, a charity and a, a social enterprise and it teaches predominantly women a wide range of heritage, thrift and craft skills. We do intensive 12 week training courses that are aligned to the fashion and textiles VQ at level five. And um, we, have, we have been running for five years in the town of Eyemouth, but we have also branched out. I'm going to answer some questions that I've raised there. Why did I do it in Berwickshire? Well, I had grown up in Berwickshire. I'd then gone to Edinburgh, managed various charities, worked for the European Commission and Scottish Government on research and policy. Then I'd gone overseas for a wee while and done some volunteering in Africa. And when I came back, I decided I didn't want to rejoin the rat race in Edinburgh and I came back to Berwickshire. I set Retweed up as a bit of a hobby project and I set it up in Berwickshire because Berwickshire is my country, as Greg was talking about, and it has the lowest average household income of any UK region. So that's quite, uh, you know, that's quite a statistic, and it's hidden poverty. I had worked in areas like Hilton, Wester Hills, Easter House, Craig Miller, and I, the Rathlock in Stirling and the poverty in Berwickshire, the free meals entitlement and those sort of indices are much higher uh, and it's hidden because it's rural. Why did I choose to do it in Eyemouth? I did it in Eyemouth because when I looked through the, when I, when I was looking through the free me meals entitlement tables, I noticed that Eyemouth had some of the highest figures in the whole of Scotland for free meals and the surrounding small village schools. I also was aware that Eyemouth had the highest percentage proportionately of social housing of any other place in the borders. Why gender specific? Well, my background had been quite a lot of gender equality work and I was aware with the changes in welfare reform that were uh, impacting most profoundly on women. And given that Berwickshire had the lowest average household income and women experienced the highest levels of poverty, I thought that the women in Berwickshire were probably amongst the poorest in the United Kingdom. Why did I make it a social enterprise and not just a straightforward charity? 
because it's a small town in a small area and labelling people as being poor is not a great thing to do. It's not particularly aspirational and it's not helpful to them or to the you know to their um, to their opportunities going forward. Why upcycling? Because I was after I spent a period of time in Africa and worked out you know the the carbon impact of the of the average person in Africa was less than one percent of somebody in Europe. I thought, right, we have to do something. And I'd also started to go to heritage, craft, maker um, festivals and shows. And I saw, and I went to the upcycling um, and recycling activities at those shows. And I noticed that nearly everybody was posh. And I realized that there was or privileged or affluent. And I realized that there was some, some issues around self-esteem, you know, that people who are not so well off don't believe that they can design or make or own or sell something that's not part of the mainstream. And I was fairly passionately pissed off that the poorest people in the developing world were mass producing stuff for the poorest people in the Western world. And although we can't change that, I thought we could, you know, we could start having a go. Um, so now, five years later, we have delivered, um, we, I think we've delivered 12 courses of our main training programme to 85 women. And when I started out, I did a lot of the legwork. I went round all the agencies that were supporting vulnerable people. I spoke at different fora and I um, made relationships with potential referral agencies. So social work, uh, mental health teams, disability agencies, rape crisis, women's aid, and, um, and asked if what we were proposing to do would be something that they would refer clients onto and we got a resounding yes. So I think the point I want to make there is that whatever people are developing in rural areas, it really does have to be bottom up and not top down. You cannot come in with a fantastic idea that you think you're gonna impose onto a local community. You have to do the grassroots work and work with agencies who are already on the ground. And in fact, in doing that, they helped shape some of the pastoral and specialist care that we provided to, to some of the more vulnerable women who were on our courses. Um, the other thing that I was aware of, I had spent a summer in Skye when I'd come back from Africa before I um, moved back to Berwickshire. And I realized that everybody coming to Skye felt like it was a part of a part of their heritage. It was very, very quick that people wanted to find out the history, the culture, the heritage, and to feel a sense of belonging. And you know, I heard people say that Sky would forever be with them. And when I came down here back to my homeland, I realized that cultural identity and celebration of our history and heritage was not quite so strong. So I thought that we could develop some of our products based around our natural heritage. And it, so our flora and our fauna, our coastal, our maritime, our agricultural, and, um, and some of the people's story. Um, so we developed a Berwickshire tartan in collaboration with International Tartan and made lots of different products. And you'll see a couple of MSPs wearing said tartans in the parliament. Um, then we developed a whole lot of partnerships with businesses and industries who were disposing of um, residual and scrap textiles and we took them. We also got huge amount of donations from other businesses, from hotels and um, bed and breakfasts and um, then community organisations and um, and individuals came. <clears throat> so we started off with no textiles and now 
we've got enough textiles to fill Edinburgh Castle, dispatched amongst uh, around various people's garages and lockups. But we also have a volunteer team. At the moment, we've got 16 who manage all our commissions. Um, and we do commissions, we do paid commissions, so we generate a trade and income. They also lead our product design and run our retail activities while we in shop and the craft events um, and they go out and about to the community to talk about their experience of retail and what we do. Um, about two years ago, <clears throat> um, we set up a commercial workshop programme for everybody. So we've delivered 42 weekend workshops and events, and we've had over 400 people coming to those events. So we've been teaching the wider community a whole wide range of thrift and craft and upcycling skills and building their environmental awareness and helping them understand the impact of their purchasing decisions and their in impact of their, you know, all other consumer decisions and the way that they dispose of their waste when it's finished. And everybody who comes over the door of our shop and their base and our workshop, basically thousands a year, get the story of <clears throat> why we exist um, to divert waste from textiles and to provide social benefit um, to our community and economic benefit to our area. We have, um, <clears throat> we have um, the Langham Initiative here today, so I thought we'd add this slide in. We, we have also sold our model um, in different forms to different areas, not lock, stock and barrel because our model has been developed in response to the needs of the area and our model is based around a community development approach and about teaching skills, building confidence, encouraging people to take responsibility for their lives and their careers and providing person-centered routes into employment and um, self-employment and sometimes volunteering because not everybody is going to get a job. So different organizations have come to approach us and asked us to come and work with them and help them better deliver um, skills and textiles training and um, environmental um, initiatives. So we have worked with Glasgow Caledonian University, Highlands and Islands Enterprise and the Langham in Initiative, which was a nice little cross south of Scotland border activity. Um, just over a year ago, we set up a business incubator <clears throat> and we worked in collaboration with Business Gateway to tailor business development support for 10 women. Um, and what we had noticed was a lot of our women wanted to set up their own businesses, but then after they did the business gateway training, they changed their minds and went off and got jobs, which is fine. We're happy for them to do that. But when we looked at feedback, they basically said that the business gateway training had been counterproductive and it had scared them off. They had enjoyed the core skills that they had le learned whilst doing the business gateway training. But in terms of confidence and, you know, that peer support, um, they just didn't feel able to go alone. And a lot of them had said, you know, especially those from outlying areas, had said we'd been isolated in our lives before we took part in retreat and we don't want to be isolated in our work. So that's why we set up the business incubator and it's still going strong, although some of what we're doing is in abeyance. Those women have developed their own businesses, but at the same time, we broker relationships for outsourced manufacturing and they make stuff for different companies up and down the land from high-end tailoring companies in London to uh, local initiatives in other parts of Scotland. Um, <clears throat> this is a wee project that we did last year. Um, it was a crowdfunder. We've done quite a lot of small projects, but we were trying to raise aware, awareness of, about the about plastic and you know the impact of plastic on our oceans and disposable plastic bags as part of that. 
So we got our women, our students, our volunteers, our graduates, and those women in our business incubator to design and develop a whole range of different tote bags. And we came up with a Borders bag and we have sold that Borders bag to lots of different retail outlets up and down the land. And we've also, the crowdfunder helped us give those Borders bags away to lots of different food banks across Berwickshire and the Borders so that when folk were going to get their food, they were getting something quite nice with their food as well and just kind of adding to the dignity and adding to the environmental education and being told at the food banks when they came back the following week to bring their Borders bag with them. Um, our corporate commissions, I um, alluded to that later, so we have made quite high-end products from our level two course, the Women in the Business Incubator, made these products for the Scottish Parliament shop um, and for um, Design and Alter, a high-end um, London tailor, um, and for another a, a, a number of other initiatives. Um, I, I suppose this is just a little bit of the background for folk who are in, in any way interested in supporting others or developing their own community assets, social enterprise, social enterprise approaches. Over the last five years, um, with the support from national social enterprise development agencies like First Poor and UK Unlimited and most especially the School for Social Entrepreneurs um, and then more recently with my participation and trusteeship with the Rural Social Enterprise Hub. Um, we, I have um, learned from my partners and collaborators that rural social enterprise and community asset type activity um, is usually smaller and is generally locally based and much more connected with strong community networks because without those strong community networks um, we wouldn't be able to achieve what we achieve. Yes, from the beginning of time Retweet was extremely fragile and we were held together with blue tack and string for the first two or three years. However, we have been able, because we've been small, we've been able to respond to exactly what was needed in our area. And we have been the right thing at the right time in the right place. And we have also been able to be extremely resilient and resourceful during COVID and we have run, our volunteers have run food banks in small village halls and church halls. We did thousands of masks, hundreds of scrubs for hospitals, for sick kids playrooms, for um, the, all the GP practices across Berwickshire. Um, we did masks for thousands of community organisations who were providing frontline support to vulnerable folk. So we've been able to respond in a way that lots of other organisations weren't able to. And we've also been able to respond to market failures in the public, third and private sectors. So we've been able to provide employability and creative personal development to women. And we've been able to provide routes into employment, sustainable routes into employment. And we've been able to provide an alternative uh, alternative products that are environmentally and socially, um, you know, they've got great credentials. Um, and it's important if we're thinking about a rural context for community assets and for social enterprise, that there's a whole agenda based around growth. And growth is not everything. Um, we have a blended model, we have trading income, and we also have grant funding, and that might always be the case, but we are also addressing some of the most profound social and environmental issues in our area, and we are very clearly contributing to economic prosperity, although we ourselves are not making a huge turnover. Um, I just want to reiterate once again, 
for any community asset development and any social enterprise development, I cannot stress strongly enough how important it is for that to be bottom up and not top down. And it has to be meeting the needs and supported by the communities we serve. There are so many folk in ivory towers or with fantastic notions that they want to come and develop something in an area because they've been here on holiday or because um, they see an opportunity. For example, people are seeing lots of opportunities with the inception of uh, SOZI. And it's important that it isn't people just with their idea of what might be right for a community. It's important that it is a community's um, a community's empowerment exercise and that they are part of the development of any initiatives and we are entirely blessed that our business community completely and wholeheartedly supports us and has sponsored us and has promoted us on social media and has promoted our commercial activities to help us make more money to, to do the social and environmental impact work and that's because we started out in a cupboard in a community in a fairly run down community centre and we focused on people and not bricks and mortar. Um, so um, th those are just some points about how you might think about making life easier for the development of rural social enterprise and equally applicable to community assets. Um, and I think I've probably said a bit a, 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 quite a bit about that already. But one thing that I think is really important for, I can only talk from a borders perspective, is access to training, to governance, to leadership, and helping people understand policy development and the issues. And um, what I see is an investment in a lot of community organizations or a lot of community assets initiatives and the governance and the leadership is dysfunctional and hasn't, you know, people do not understand the role. And it has been extremely frustrating for me trying to put my square peg of my urban centric professional um, experience into a rural round peg hole. And I have had a steep learning curve, although I've done community planning in lots of places, in lots of rural areas, and I'd worked for a couple of years in high as a consultant in rural communities, I still had very a great deal to learn. So I think that for anybody listening here at the webinar, uh, you know, something things that I would really encourage you to consider are humility and listening and really understanding community needs and not voicing your own notions and also facilitating community empowerment but making sure that that is balanced with strong leadership training, strong understanding of what governance in the third sector means and access to training, translating what the policy developments are and helping them understand what the issues are um, and how best to respond to them. I think that's maybe me. Um, <clears throat> so responsible business, i.e. Social, social enterprise or community asset um, activity. I think um, Greg really set the tone earlier there. We do have to um, conceptualise the relationship between people, place and planet. And we do re need to re-envision education and business and community development for a sustainable future. And we all have to think about how we're going to live well in the world. And um, we are the people who are here and interested today are those people who are interested in people and planet before profit. So I would urge you to think about how best you can do that. As I heard somebody say quite recently, we have 12 years, we're standing on, you know, we're standing on a burning platform. We have 12, 12 years to transform that. And the third sector are the key players in that, I believe. Thank, Thank you, Hazel. That's amazing. Again, there's just so much incredible information and inspiring work that's coming out of what you're doing. Um, and I love the fact that you're seeing beyond the obvious, you know, this sort of hidden poverty and that you've really kind of pushed for that. To, and also like the disruption of the 
um, the textile design industry. I love that as well. But um, yeah. that was thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we are kind of running a little bit over, so if um, people have questions but they can't stay then please do put them in the chat box but if you can stay for a little longer then please do otherwise our video will be on um, Vimeo afterwards so um, it gives me pleasure now to introduce Stacey Bradley from the south of Scotland community housing and um, over to you Stacey. Hi everyone thanks to Community Land Scotland for arranging this event and thank you all for coming along today it's really great to hear about some of the initiatives that are happening across the south of Scotland. Um, I'm going to share my screen now so I've got a wee presentation for you and um, so if you just bear with me. So my name is Stacey Bradley I'm the project manager for South of Scotland Community Housing uh, also known as SOSH. Um, we, you might know us as previously being called Dumfries and Galloway Small Communities Housing Trust. Uh, we were established in 2006 to address the shortfall um, in rural housing to ensure that there was a, a, a needs and demands process uh, being considered for uh, the provision of rural housing across the southwest of Scotland. Uh, it was a study that was conducted by Shelter and our organisation or, or, our organisation was born out of that. Uh, we've just recently rebranded in November 2020 and we've done this to, uh, to demonstrate how we've grown as an organisation and how uh, our ambitions for the future to work over a broader area beyond Dumfries and Galloway and across the south of Scotland, but also to work across a wider range of uh, communities. So our main aim is to support, facilitate and enable uh, affordable community-led housing uh, in communities across the south of Scotland. I primarily work in our rural communities um, where we address localised needs and demands uh, for housing and assist community organisations to address those at a local level. We do that by working across a range of uh, national and local government uh, structures, including the council, uh, registered social landlords. Uh, we work with Community Land Scotland, the Land Commission to uh, promote our work and to discuss the wider concept of community empowerment and land reform. Um, and we're also now working strategically with South of Scotland Enterprise, who will be a key player uh, for all of our projects across the south of Scotland, including for, for the other communities who are here today. It's a fantastic asset that, that we now have, having the South of Scotland Enterprise. And we're really looking forward to working uh, together as, as we move forward. So we also have a, a couple of other projects that we're working on at the moment, um, including the Sustainable Housing for Inclusive and Cohesive Cities, uh, also known as SHIC, which is a Radio Stars award-winning um, European community-led housing project um, as part of an interreg project, which we are now a partner of and have been since September. And we've got <clears throat> Annabelle, who I believe is in the, the session mm -hmm. today, um, as our work as our uh, member staff who's working on that project and we also have a post-COVID living project which I'll talk to um, as we come further through my presentation. So we like to look at the wider uh, impacts of, um, of how uh, affordable housing shapes a community. So it's considering the economic benefits, uh, the, re the, the opportunity to repopulate and ch challenge uh, aging demographics which are prevalent across the south of Scotland. Uh, addressing social benefits, many of the projects that we work with also have social enterprise elements or wider social um, aspects to their project work. Um, we're doing several projects that consider uh, climate change and um, fuel poverty, which is also prevalent across the south of Scotland, especially in our rural areas where we tend to be off grid. So there's all sorts of different aspects to consider as, as we move through a, a project's life cycle. Um, but we're very much focused on repopulation and regeneration uh, moving forward as an organisation. So I'm not going to bore you with the context of the um, policies and funding that, that we go through, but I will quickly glance over this because I'm aware we're, we're a wee bit short on time. So we primarily work with the drivers of community empowerment and land reform uh, to help communities access specific types of uh, levers to um, allow them to access land or buildings. Uh, and, and that includes the, the Scottish Land Fund, where there's a requirement to acquire the land or asset um, that, that can't be addressed through community asset transfer, for example. And we work primarily with the Rural Housing Fund for the majority of the development of the, the, um, the housing solution, whether it's a new build or a refurbishment. 
Um, I'll talk a wee bit more about some of the projects so you can get a flavour of the sort of things that, that we're working on. But we also have the Town Centre Living Fund, which is um, administered by the Police and Gallery Council that, that we access quite regularly with our communities. And that comes from Second Homes Council Tax. It's a great, great piece of funding that allows us to, to help um, build the, the funding package for the various projects that we work on. Also the Town Centre Capital Fund, um, which is Scottish Government pot funding. But we also work with ethical lenders and various sort of wind farms. And uh, we also work with housing burdens um, as a rural housing body ourselves as well. So we provide a comprehensive long-term support to communities from inception straight through the project feasibility, uh, delivery stages and beyond into management. It's really, really important to me to start building that relationship with our communities as soon as possible um, so that we can start to understand what the localised needs of the community that we're working with are and um, consider the needs and de demands for local uh, in terms of what, what the local area needs for, for housing going forward, how we can facilitate those opportunities and, and how we can approach uh, the, the feasibility package um, to start exploring some of the ideas that the community group generally already has when, when they come to us. It's not always the case. We do have some communities that just think that housing is, a, is a, an issue that needs to be addressed and, and we then need to explore the possibilities locally. So we work on a really dynamic basis to consider the options and explore the viability of the project, considering the needs and demands, financial planning, um, you know, full discounted cash flows, and uh, the potential for future development as well. So we need to consider the management aspects at a very early stage to ensure that the project is viable. We do that by pulling in a range of experts. Uh, so we work normally with design teams, uh, which include architects and quantity surveyors, but also uh, partners from other organisations, uh, such as the Land Fund, um, who can bring expertise to and, and the Development Trust Association Scotland, uh, who can bring in legal expertise to, to help constitute the, the organisations in a way that allows them to access the fund. And so there are a number of different organisations that we work alongside in order to support the communities to deliver. Um, at present, we're currently supporting 16 communities um, across urban and rural Dumfries and Galloway. And here's a list of them, just to prove that I'm not telling you fibs. Um, we've got a wide range of different projects across Dumfries and Galloway primarily, but as I've said, we are expanding to work out into the, the, um, the Borders region as well and across the south of Scotland. So there's, there's nowhere sort of south of the, the central belt that we wouldn't consider um, the opportunity to work with uh, some of the communities. We've got some upcoming new projects, which is really exciting. I like, as, as we work through the, the process, it's nice to, to have seen some of our projects now concluding and be moving on to beginnings with new projects as well. So it's a cyclical thing that we're, we've got different projects at different levels. Um, and we're also managing some of our own projects where we're looking to manage uh, affordable housing and, and let that out ourselves. So here's a wee map which hasn't actually turned out too well on the big screen, but it kind of shows the spread of projects across um, across the area that we're working on, and it's kind of colour coded to reflect the, the different types of communities that we're working in. So some of these are rural communities, some are more sort of small towns. We've obviously got the Dumfries project from Mid Steeple Quarter, which is uh, our main urban project, and some of our new projects that are coming on stream now as well. So I wanted to talk um, through a, a handful of our projects and I, you know, try and keep this as brief as possible, um, but just to give you an insight into some of the community uh, ownership projects that, that are happening across Dumfries and Galloway uh, primarily. So one of our flagship projects at the minute is uh, our, the first community owned passive certified passive house development in, uh, in Scotland is at Closeburn. Um, it's a small plot of land that was uh, the community took ownership of through community asset transfer. Myth Valley Leaf Trust is the organisation that we've been working with since 2014, I think. Um, Myth Valley Leaf Trust have previous ownership of one local uh, community owned house, which Deputy Gallery Small Communities House and Trust helped them to, to uh, take ownership of and have assisted with management throughout. And that positive experience led them to consider what other options there were to support their, their local community, their fallen school role, and, and to bring a greater opportunity for affordable family housing into the, the small village um, and, and the, the uh, mid and upper Nistail area of Dumfries and Galloway. So through that, they considered their options locally and found a plot of land um, which belonged to Dumfries and Galloway Council, which they took as a community asset transfer. 
um, and paid £15,000 of the support of the land fund to uh, take ownership off and then used rural housing fund along with a, a wider package um, of funding to develop these fantastic. It's actually now been shortlisted in the SURF Awards in the Housing Regeneration category um, and is home to 11 residents, so six adults and five children, which are all supporting the school roles. It's, it's a great project that really shows the difference that community ownership can make to a small community. And these people now have safe, warm homes for the winter. Some of them were, were facing eviction in their previous uh, housing. Some of them were living in poor conditions and it's just really nice to be able to, to offer that. Uh, Nith Valley Leaf Trust are now looking at a third project, um, so we're, we're in discussion with them. And I think that just shows that once a community gets a taste for community ownership, um, not only do they maybe sometimes take it in different directions as well as housing, but it's likely that you know, they'll see the benefits of, of that process and engage with it further um, in future. Uh, another project, this is actually one of the first projects that I started working on when I began working for Dumfries and Galloway Small Communities House and Trust back in 2017, um, is Wigton Bank of Scotland. Uh, Wigton had developed a um, Wigton Bladnock Community Initiative, was born out of a desire for local affordable uh, housing to be under localised control. So a group met in, in Wigton and uh, decided that they wanted to consider their options relative to a specific plot of land and a specific development, but quickly became inclined to consider any option that was that was available to um, address their localised housing needs and demands. So at, round about the same time, it was made clear that the Bank of Scotland uh, in the, on the High Street was, was scheduled to close as many Banks of Scotland, uh, Bank of Scotland buildings up and down the country were at that time. And the community saw that as an opportunity to take uh, ownership of a key property in the town and develop it for positive community use rather than losing an asset they wanted to, to be uh, gaining something for, for their community. So through uh, localised needs and demands assessment, excuse me, and um, consideration uh, of the, the prospect, consideration of, of the viability of the building as a, as a community owned project, uh, the community decided to take forward a uh, community right to buy, which is a uh, an unusual process to uh, an unusual route for us as, a, as an organisation to use. In fact, we've only worked for one community who has successfully used community right to buy or even considered using community right to buy. But it's an excellent tool that allows the community the preemptive right to uh, buy a property if it's put on the open market and gain support from the community through a ballot, which Wigton Blood, Blood and Community Initiative did successfully do and took ownership of the building with an award from the Land Fund. That building is now going to be developed, is in the process of being developed, in fact it's on site at the moment, into two homes. So upstairs there's going to be a family, <clears throat> a three bedroom family home um, with the most fantastic views across Wigton Bay. Um, I'm quite jealous of, of the views that, that that house is going to benefit from, it's absolutely stunning. And to the rear uh, of, of the building there's going to be a self-contained uh, accessible amenity apartment um, which has been decided uh, in line with localised needs and demands. So there was a clear need for, for family housing, but also for uh, accessible housing, uh, potentially for older people or people who have a uh, need for, for, for that sort of facilities. Um, and on top of that, there will also be a community owned, uh, owned and managed bunkhouse, which will have uh, eight beds um, and support the local uh, book festival, walking routes, and there will also be a community garden uh, to the rear of the building as well. So it's a really exciting development that, that brings in the sort of repopulation and regeneration aspects in the whole, um, and it allows the community to um, develop a solution um, to their, their initial desire to tackle affordable housing, but also to consider the broader community benefits. So while they came to us with a specific idea, um, that, that idea has changed and developed into something, uh, I think, more cohesive and broader, and hopefully we'll consider working um, on future community-owned housing projects. So here's just a wee picture of what, what the, the building looks like. Um, and it's, as I say, currently on site, it's a local architect who's working on the, the design work and a local contractor who are, are doing the work for the refurbishment of that building. Um, next up, we have the, the Grapes at Whithorn. Uh, the Grapes is a former hotel um, which has been derelict for 
more than 30 years and has been a real eyesore and a real blight for the local community. Um, it has been a, a genuine cause of concern where it's been privately owned and there have been various moves made over that 30 year period to try and, and do something with this large building to, uh, to offer a positive um, a positive impact on the time, but, but nothing has come to fruition, unfortunately, and until now, um, the All Roads Lead to Whithorn group uh, took ownership of the, the grapes in August this year with a, a, an award from the Scottish Land Fund, and we are now in the process of uh, seeking tender for that project. We've got the full funding package in place, and it's going to be developed into two three-bedroom family homes in line with localised needs and demands. Um, you'll see this, this road that, that runs up the side of the grapes, that's the, the building right here in the corner. The road that runs up the side takes you to the local primary school, so it's very close proximity for, for families. And that was very much the identified need for, uh, for this local community. The second, it's a two-phase pro project, so the first phase will we'll see the development of, of these two family homes. The second phase will see the development of the two buildings to the rear on this slide. Um, which are will be fully accessible three bedroom family homes as well, and again that's in line with localised needs and demands. Um, the all roads lead to Whithorn Group have, are, have got their their hands absolutely full because not only are they developing this project, they're also taking ownership of their town hall and uh, develop develop a community facility, um, which is which is going to be fantastic as well. I'm not going to speak to that because obviously my my um, expertise here is on housing and. You, but I think it shows the, the sort of regeneration aspects of many of the communities that we're looking at and work, working with or, or working on multifaceted problem projects where the housing is identified as um, a, a problem that needs a solution in, in the wider sense. So not only do we need to create opportunities to live in our rural communities, but also uh, opportunities for work, leisure and socialising as well. So um, considering these things in the round, quite often projects go hand in hand. Uh, the final project that I, I want to just run over really quickly is uh, one that we are um, in the process of working up at the moment. Uh, this is a community asset transfer of the land, which comes from Dumfries and Galloway Council up in Kelloff Home. Um, the project's being run by and Kirkconnell and Kelloff Home Development Trust. Um, and this is going to see the development of five uh, passive house standard uh, two bedroom homes that are um, technology enabled for older people. Uh, Kelloff Home Community has a lot of family housing which is underutilised because a lot of families have moved away from the area. Um, and it doesn't have any facilities for older people to remain in their communities if they start to develop um, health needs as, as, as they grow older. So the community wants to um, address this by developing uh, technology enabled housing so that it's not necessarily a uh, sheltered housing, doesn't necessarily need to be staffed. Um, and this is a pilot project which we're working across a range of partners to, to try and deliver. Um, so the community asset transfer was approved um, back end of November. Uh, so the community are now in the process of taking ownership of the land and we're pulling together the, the capital funding package for that as we speak um, and, and moving ahead with that project. So hopefully that'll be a real boost for that community and allow the older people who, who live there to remain amongst family and friends rather than having to move out with the community. Um, we're also working on a, a really interesting and exciting project. Uh, so this is the post-COVID, a model for post-COVID living. Um, we've got a secondment from John Gilbert Architects, the fantastic Nadia working with us part-time at the moment to deliver this project. It's a, um, a lottery funded project, the Emerging Futures Fund, which looks at how we take the situation that we're in with COVID and apply a set of principles to design for future housing that allow us to address some of the needs that have um, developed through the pandemic situation. So it's a really interesting, exciting cutting edge project. Um, if you would be interested in contributing to our survey, which is currently up and running, check out our social media, it's all on there. And uh, please have, have your say and uh, what you feel are priorities for housing of the future uh, that allow us to deal with challenges of the situation that we're currently in and potentially considering more sort of live work opportunities for the future. So for us as an organisation, we are um, entirely focused on community ownership 
and moving forward with our rebrand and delivering our services across a, a wider area across the south of Scotland. So having the ability to work across a significantly larger area means that we're able to help a wider range of communities. We're able to work more closely with the groups that we're already working with to develop their learning and also to share that with, with new projects that, that come up come across our radar. And we're really, really keen to take on a, a wider range of opportunities and happy to work with, with any communities across the south of Scotland to consider uh, their ideas for community-led housing and, and how we can address that using some of the levers that we've, we've talked about. So we believe really strongly that community-led housing sits at the heart of community ownership. And that it's, it's the key aspect in unlocking community regeneration, tackling repopulation, challenging uh, aging demographics, looking at climate change and uh, tackling um, fuel poverty, but also considering you know, the benefits of live work solutions, uh, developing our rural economy and um, attracting new opportunities to uh, the south of Scotland area, which you know, are desperately needed, I think. And uh, we're in, in, a, in a, a, a time where opportunity is prevalent across the south. So I think we need, we need to look at how we harness that. Um, we're now in a position where there's a commitment to the Third Scotch Land Fund, which is excellent, and that allows us to consider um, opportunities for uh, taking ownership of, uh, helping communities to take ownership of assets. And the Rural Housing Fund has been extended. We're waiting to uh, get a bit more information as to what that extension looks like. But we want to continue to explore the possibilities of community-led housing and, and work with communities across the south to uh, achieve their aims. So that's my contact details. Um, if anybody wants to get in touch or obviously if there's questions at the end, I'll be happy to take them. Um, but I'll stop sharing my screen and let you get on to the next participant. Thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you for that. That was incredible. Again, there's so much information there and I'm really interested to see how those houses develop with the um, technology enabled Passive houses. That's um, really, really interesting for our region. Okay, um, well, cracking on. Um, we've now got uh, Margaret Poole from the Langham Initiative. So I'm going to hand over to you, Margaret, and um, enjoy. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Oops. Yeah, we can hear you, Margaret. Right. Um, I should start off by saying that uh, Langham, I am chair of Langham Initiative and have been for the last three uh, and a bit years. Um, Langham Initiative has a long history. It um, was formed in 1994 and originally it was an umbrella organisation which um, looked after a number of subgroups. However, we've moved on since then. Uh, for, no, for many years, we were subsidised by uh, the local council. That ceased around um, nine years ago. And we have, we, um, our project have be, been project driven for a number of years. Um, Langham, unfortunately, has been in a spiral of decline. There have been, we were a textile town originally. Um, the mills have gradually closed. We have one remaining mill, which I'm very happy to say was rescued by a, a management buyout um, about three months ago. And it appears to be ticking over quite nicely. They have uh, demand from niche markets for their materials. Um, and it looks very promising. We're hoping that there will be apprenticeships come in due course in that mill. So textiles will continue after a fashion. Um, I have to say, as far as uh, the initiative are concerned, we uh, currently run uh, five projects, uh, Wild Estale, which is concentrated on uh, education in the environment and, and uh, countryside. Um, it delivers John Muir Awards and Forest School Awards, works very closely with the cluster schools in the area. Um, we have Langham Moor project, which I will major on today, if uh, you'll forgive me. Uh, Digital Skills, which is an intergenerational um, project. Uh, Textile Sdales, Textiles Sdale, our current textile project, which has done a lot to um, interact with Retweed, 
Uh, we've learned a lot from them, and I think they've learned one or two things from us as well. Uh, we also have a sports centre refurbishment project on the go. Um, it's uh, hit a bit of a problem at the moment, but I think that will be overcome in time. And we also do uh, Welcome to Langham, which is a tourist information and community information centre in the centre of town. However, today I want to speak about our buyout of Langham Moor. Uh, like Greg um, earlier, uh, we were hit with the news that the clue were going to put this land on the market. It came in May 2019. Um, because we hadn't shown an interest in, uh, well, we didn't know that the land was ever going to be sold, um, we were taken unawares. However, the initiative board um, at a meeting with the project leaders decided that they would have a go at buying, buying or showing an interest in buying the land for the community. At the time, we had just recently employed uh, a young man called Kevin Cumming. Kevin came to us um, as the Wild Estale manager and it, we had the vision that we would develop ecotourism in the area. Uh, Langham Moor is one of the best sites in the UK for viewing hen harriers, a much persecuted bird. Um, but we, we could see the potential of ecotourism. Sorry, I'll have to ignore, ignore a telephone. <laughs> It can go to answer phone. <laughs> um, he had a very, very good first season in 2019. Um, tremendous uh, responses from the, the clients that he took out. But as I say, in May, we were told that the, the moor was on the, on the horizon. He took up the, the um, challenge and uh, together with board members and other volunteers, uh, we formed a working, working group to um, pursue this. We were asked immediately to identify community backing for a buyout challenge. And that was actually achieved within eight days. Once we had done that, we had to provide evidence um, of uh, how we would go about getting a valuation and so forth. Uh, we managed to prove to um, community land, um, sorry, the Scottish Land Fund that uh, we had all the right ideas. We engaged with the clue, uh, developed a very good working relationship with them. And by May 2020, we had a reached, a reached agreement with them on the valuation. Um, we had two options, uh, 10,500 acres, which was, which was costed at 6.4 million pounds. That was option one. And there was an option two of 5,200 acres. And the price for it was 4,000, 4.2 million. 4 million. Um, it, um, when we reached this agreement about the valuation, that was in May 2020, we were then informed that we had six months in which to uh, find the money for either of these options, or the Scottish Land Fund would take back the million pounds which they had put up towards the purchase. Um, we protested about that and we were supported by a cross-party group of MPs and we managed to get them to uh, relax the conditions but we still had to have the money at least in play promised by um, October 2020 six months from the valuation given to the delivery more or less and I'm delighted to say that we had some splendid support. Uh, not only did the Scottish Land Fund leave the million pounds in place, we were supported by SOCI, uh, 
to the tune of a million as well. Uh, John Muir Trust were one of the first organizations that Kevin approached, um, not only for support money-wise, but um, they proved to be pivotal in engaging with us, engaging with uh, other environmental uh, trusts. And out of that, we managed to secure monies from the Carmen Foundation, Bentley, the Bentley Foundation, Garfield Weston, uh, Woodland Trust. The clue gave a discount when they saw how well we were doing, I think, um, a substantial discount. And uh, our crowdfunder, which had been set at £200,000 uh, target, actually succeeded uh, exceeded that considerably. And I think we finished up £52,000 over our target for that. Um, I have to say that we had some really touching uh, contributions from smaller groups. And uh, one of them was Sunnyside Primary in Glasgow, a central Glasgow uh, primary school. They did a sponsored wild wa wildlife wander and raised 400 pounds, which I think was a terrific effort on the part of the children. Apparently they are very, very environmentally in, um, conscious. Um, and they have in turn connected with Canaby and Langham Primary Schools, and we hope in the future to have them on a visit to the, to the moor. We were also supported by Chris Packham, the TV personality, who dedicated his Hen Harrier Day money um, to the cause. And of course, we have the support from several NGOs, Borders Forest Trust, Rewilding Britain, RSPB, Trees for Life, many raptor groups, the Revive Coalition, Forestry Land Scotland and Land Scotland. So um, these were all important, but most, of, most important of all, and really a backroom room boy in a sense, was a chap called Richard Bunting, who did all our press releases and contacted media and radio. Um, absolutely fantastic. Richard gave his services pro bono. Um, his day job is with Greenpeace. So it was, it's great. We've made a new friend through in, in Richard. Um, Kevin also cultivated connections with uh, Ben Goldsmith, who heads up the Environmental Founders Forum. And um, the publicity that we got through the John Muir Trust publication, um, where they made us um, the subject for their community appeal 2020. Um, the direct responses we got from that um, were terrific. Uh, one in particular was a gentleman who phoned me up and said that um, he had a, been a long time lover of the countryside, a cyclist, he'd walked the border hills, he'd done the Southern Upland Way, uh, he was now terminally ill, but he wanted his money to come to the Moorland uh, project. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll keep this fairly short because I think I've, I've covered most, most uh, aspects. Um, our current efforts are directed towards setting up a standalone trading company. In other words, a trading subsidiary we want to retain our uh, charitable status um, because we feel that we have a function within the community as a charity. But one of the reasons for be becoming a trading company is um, in order to get around this issue that we've always had with our projects of having to go outside to find um, funding for them. It very rarely lasts for more than a year, two years at the very most, and it takes up project um, leaders' time, uh, an inordinate amount of their, their time in trying to, to achieve 
the funding for the projects. So um, we hope that as we develop the economic potential of the moor, uh, we will be able to um, be more self-reliant as far as our other projects are concerned. Um, I am happy to report that uh, we have funding in place now for a commercial manager who will look at the economic potential of the moor. And uh, we also have funding in place for a moorland manager who uh, will look at setting up the nature reserve, which we see as the heart of the whole, um, the whole uh, project. Uh, the project has four cor cornerstones. Uh, that's ecological restoration, community regeneration, renewable energy, and wildlife conservation. We hope that um, it will bring new people into the area. We have potential in um, the fact that we take over uh, six properties at, at this particular stage. Um, there is possibilities that we might uh, relate to the lady who is in charge of the, the housing in Dumfries and Galloway. We may come back to her for a device. I think that's the advantage of doing a, a, an episode like this. We are able to interact with others who are, have similar aims to ourselves and some of, them, some of whom who are I, highly uh, skilled in knowing how to go about um, the, the things that we want to achieve. I think interaction is, is, is everything here. Um, so much. I think that's 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 me just about completed what I wanted to say. And thank you all for listening. It's not nearly as professional as Greg and and the ones who have gone before me, but um, it's it's an it, it it gives you an inkling of what we're trying to do here in Manor. Oh, that was great. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm amazed about how successful your crowdfunder was. That was fantastic. And those jobs sound like two incredible jobs I think you're going to be inundated with applicants for those hopefully thank you so much thank you okay um last but not least on to Alan we are slightly over so if you do have to leave um like I said our video is going to be on uh Vimeo um but hopefully you can stay in here Alan Alan talk all right over to you Alan um thanks Amy yeah that's right folks just leave now <laughs> um, it's been inspirational to hear some of the speakers um, this morning, or even this afternoon now, and uh, um, I, I will cut my part um, so that um, you can all go off and get some lunch. Um, the situation in Annan, I think, is slightly different to, to some of what we've heard previously. Um, we are, um, what, we're not a large town by any stretch of the imagination. But we've always thought of ourselves as a small, large town because of, um, despite being in a rural area, um, we've always had significant industry. Um, after the days when uh, Annan used to get burnt down on a regular basis, um, suddenly it became a very pro prosperous place in the middle of the 18th century, um, and then again in the middle of the uh, Victorian times, and then again in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, so it's... Um, it's um, been cyclical to say the least in the history of Annan. Um, it's always, as I said, um, been industrial in modern times, um, principally because of the river, um, cotton works, um, then ships, shipbuilding. Engineering has been the mainstay throughout the most of the uh, 20th century. Um, and that's backed up by um, fishing and um, fish processing in recent times. Um, our particular interest is um, Annan Harbour. Um, our group was formed in 2011. And um, the reason behind that was um, an action group or a steering group had got together um, to write a master plan for Annan, which was concerned with ensuring economic prosperity post Chapel Cross. 
Chapel Cross, as some of you might know, was the um, first nuclear facility in Scotland. Um, some people say it was a power station. It wasn't. It was to produce um, plutonium um, for the Cold War era. Um, and then later on, it went to produce tritium. The amount of electricity produced there was minimal. But nevertheless, it was a fantastic boon for Annan in that a thousand people came to live here. Um, schools had to be built um, and it produced um, a short term economic boom in the late 50s and throughout the 60s. Um, it changed the nature of Annan um, and I'll come on to that again later, but um, if you like it was a good employer um, It produced um, for at least two generations jobs for life, um, but it had come to the end of its useful life. Um, that had been extended many times, uh, but um, the last a significant tranche of jobs were being lost. Work was being done to study how um, Annan would cope with the loss of these jobs. So um, the master plan was underway, and to some of our dismay, um, Annan Harbour didn't get a look in. Now Annan Harbour is the raison d'être of Annan. Um, you know, the Romans traveled up that river, the Vikings traveled up the river, the Normans um, began sea traffic, um, and then throughout the rest of time, Annan uh, was dependent on that river to provide power for mills um, and commerce via ships. Um, so a small group was formed um, to fight the corner, um, and that group had a modicum of success in that the master plan was adopted um, slightly so that the harbour became recognised as one of Annan's gateways. Um, it became, in 2014, um, a constituted voluntary organisation and it began a number of small scale projects, interpretation boards, um, events, harbour festival and various bits and pieces and um, that was all going quite well but um, every time the group had some ideas about what might be achieved, they came up against a couple of major roadblocks. First of these was the fact that the Annan Harbour Trust had been declared moribund by Dumfries and Gallery Council. Um, when councils were local, indeed Annan Town Council and Annandale and Estale District Council, um, these organisations had provided terrific support to the Harbour Trust because it recognised the value um, economically. Um, as soon as that value disappeared um, and after regionalization, Dumfries and Galloway Council um, had no interest in supporting a facility that wasn't producing sufficient income, so they declared it moribund, which was unfortunately because, unfortunate because it happened at a time when there were changes in the fishing industry um, and the fishermen who'd been the mainstay of the trust um, had to go off and find other species to catch. Uh, they moved away from shrimps and they went off to catch um, queenies and um, king scallops. Um, so everybody that uh, was perhaps in a position to help us said, um, well, you haven't actually got any authority, you're not the trust. A harbour trust cannot be extinguished um, other than by act of parliament. Um, so that costs quite a bit of money. Um, there was no prospect of the Feast and Gallery Council taking on the harbour, um, so we were in a bit of a quandary. Um, the organisation moved forward and in 2016 was successful with a bid to leader um, and funding from the Robertson and Hollywood Trust to begin a programme of, of um, opportunities for young people. Um, in boat building and other other things. Um, premises were acquired and uh, the boat building program began and the young people were recruited um, to work alongside the skilled older men. Um, and this, uh, this uh, was when I became involved in the project um, with the title of redevelopment and in Harbour Redevelopment Officer, which I thought was quite grand at the time. Um, but I had no inkling of what that actually involved. Our programme with the young people was fine, except um, the premises we'd acquired were cold, they were damp, um, and they were well away from the harbour, so not ideal. 
Um, we managed to build a couple of boats up there, um, but it was difficult to retain young people um, just because of the difficult conditions. Um, so uh, we found ourselves at the end of 2019 looking for new premises. We were lucky to find um, a refurbished shed um, owned by one of our trustees down at the harbour. And we moved in um, at the end of February 2020. Um, just in time to put all our stuff in the shed um, when lockdown came along. Um, we had uh, uh, all the workshop activities at that point ceased. So we had a men's shed operating and we had work ongoing with looked after children, with um, kids who were school refusers and with youngsters who were about to leave school with few qualifications uh, and who were looking for opportunities, um, apprenticeships or foundation um, courses in construction and the like. Um, these guys came to us, we found them meaningful employment. Um, we built garden benches uh, for other charities and a variety of other things. And all the youngsters um, we had effectively got something to put on their CV to say they'd turned up and they'd been able to work with um, older adults, they'd been able to receive instructions and they'd learned a little bit about work ethics. Um, so we had um, good results with the youngsters, but of course now with lockdown, um, we have nobody in our workshop whatsoever. We'd always had a notion um, to acquire premises of our own. We thought this was a bit of a pipe dream. Um, a lot of the property at the harbour is um, derelict, abandoned and un neglected, or all of those things. Um, so that's where we'd, um, if you like, focused our attention and we'd attended several seminars on the abandoned and neglected land um, modification um, that were going through Scottish Parliament over the last few years. And we thought this was going to be our route, but um, we got wind of the Town Centre Capital Fund um, through working alongside the Council's regeneration team. And we were working with them because Annan had suffered another major blow in 2017-18 when Pinnies withdrew near, nearly 500 jobs from Annan in, in uh, fish processing and they were relocated uh, to Grimsby. And that was a major blow. So Annan got, for the first time, um, a dedicated regeneration team. Um, we worked with them. We heard about the um, Town Centre Capital Fund, and we thought that might be an opportunity for us to use as match funding for a stage one bid to Scottish Land Fund. Um, so we started to work up an, an idea of acquiring a semi a, a, a warehouse in, in, in a poor state of repair, it has to be said, but in a very prominent position um, on the quayside at Annan. And also um, a more or less abandoned piece of land um, that had been in, in the same family ownership for probably 50 years. Um, now, in both these cases, these have been acquired by families with interesting uh, commercial ideas. But uh, over time, these had not come to any fruition and um, both the subjects were in quite neglected condition. We were quite surprised when we made an approach to the owners of uh, both subjects um, that they, they were willing to sell. But at that time, their expectations were well beyond what we felt was a sensible market value. Nevertheless, we proceeded um, with the Community Capital Fund um, we were made an offer, uh, but then we had a very frustrating um, three or four months while um, the council worked out how it was going to um, disburse these funds. Um, and this was hugely frustrating as we saw um, the second phase of the Scottish Land Fund disappearing. And we saw a major awards um, to Newcastle and, and Langham. And we thought there'd be no money left in the Scottish Land Fund by the time we got there. Um, and um, we had hoped um, to get an application in, in um, at least six months earlier than, than we did. But nevertheless, um, we used the match from um, Town Centre Capital Fund. We were successful with, with um, a phase one, a stage one um, bid to Scottish Land Fund. 
and that enabled us to um, work up our ideas, employ the professionals, um, and put um, a case in place um, to make a bid um, for stage two funding the acquisition. Um, this was at exactly the right or exactly the wrong time. Um, opinions differ within our organization. I personally think we were quite lucky that lockdown occurred. We were quite lucky that um, um, some very good professionals were sitting at home looking for interesting projects because we were able to, um, even before we got the, the um, stage one award, we were able to put out um, some a, 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 a commission brief. Um, we were inundated um, with people who wanted to come and be our consultants. Um, and some of the best people in Scotland <laughs> wanted to be in, involved. We used a very complex um, system, um, which is owned by Dumfries and Galloway Council to, to work out who was actually giving us the best deal, who was giving us, um, would provide us with what we needed. And in particular, um, we realized it was going to be very, very hard during lockdown um, to do the community consultation that we needed to do. We'd already been doing community consultation for about a year, um, and that was gradually ramping up. Um, so we'd got submissions uh, from about 150 local people, uh, but we felt it needed um, professionalized, if you like. We'd done it in-house. Um, we needed to demonstrate to the Scottish Land Fund that we were a community-based organization, and that in Annan gives us a bit of a problem. Um, in a town of 10,000 people, it's pretty hard to get a majority um, um, a meaningful majority um, simply because of disinterest um, and simply through the challenges of reaching all those people. We told the Land Fund um, that we were going to focus on the, area, the communities, um, three of them in particular, nearest the harbour um, because of their historical links. And they were the communities of Waterfoot, which was a sort of 1930s um, pre-war housing estate, um, Wood Avenue area, which was the 1970s um, social housing estate. And the other community was Back of the Hill, which is the former, it's where most of the, the, the fishermen um, in the district lived. Um, so we concentrated on those communities, um, which was about 1,500 people. We circulated them on a quarterly basis with um, newsletters. Um, we asked them to become involved in all the other stuff that we did, the events that we do, um, the festivals that we put on, and gradually built up a relationship with that part of the community of Annan, which is um, sufficient to satisfy um, Scottish Land Fund. Fortunately, um, so as I say, we'd done some consultation, we'd got their views, um, we'd got their ideas about what could happen. In at Annan Harbour Festival, we, we attracted a crowd of 3,000 people and we were able to talk to a huge proportion of those guys um, and they came up with all sorts of weird and wonderful um, things, um, some of which we thought were terrific and some of which we thought were slightly crazy or too ambitious, but nevertheless, this is what the community was telling us. Um, so we gave that to the, um, I'll backtrack again, um, the consultants we chose um, were Community Enterprise Limited um, Scotland and ARC Architects, and um, ARC Architects then in turn um, brought in the environmental specialists, they brought in quantity quantity of surveyors, they brought in um, the various other professionals that we need, including um, landscape architects. Um, so we went to them with our ideas um, and they said, that's fine. They did, they were able to do um, stuff online um, via the dreaded Zoom um, and phone calls and stakeholders and all the people they need to do. We felt that they could have done a little bit more and we wanted to do a lot more, but it was, um, if you imagine it, you remember back to the beginning of, of um, um, lockdown when we were not also 
au fait with Zoom and all the rest of it, 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 it was quite hard. Um, and I'm in lockdown really, really hard um, because there was um, one or two initial cases locally uh, that focused the mind and uh, people in Anna weren't going anywhere. So our consultants managed to speak to about 250 people in total, which added to the ones, or they may have been the same people that we'd previously spoken to, we felt we'd got some good ideas. The feasibility study, when it came along um, towards the end of June, beginning of July, was a little bit surprising to us. And um, because all the things that we thought we wanted to do in that piece of land were there, but there were some other things as well. And um, my trustees had an interesting um, decision to make as to what direction to take the project. Um, and the question that was put back to us is, you know, you want this building um, to do your stuff, but your stated objective is to regenerate Annan Harbour. So why don't you lead by example and be the organization that regenerates Annan Harbour? So that meant um, a considerable change to what we thought we wanted to happen within that building. Um, and, and the consultants were, were absolutely right. Um, and they came up with, with, with um, a mix of activity. And uh, their mix of activity is, um, or has immediately proved to be to be more sustainable than ours, in that um, there's huge capital costs um, with what we want to do, but at the end of that capital cost, we immediately have a sustainable business, um, in as much that anybody looking forward in these strange times um, can make that statement. Um, so the cafe, which we thought was a little bit of an uh, adjunct, was number one on the top of the uh, community list. They wanted to be able to sit down at Annan Harbour, have their cup of coffee and look out and view the wildlife, uh, view the environment. Um, connection with the environment became much, much more important than we ever thought it would be. We felt we were going to buy um, an abandoned piece of land um, and use it as a means of accessing the river. Uh, but the community um, were adamant that this was about reconnecting Annan with, 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 with its environment um, and its heritage. Um, so heritage again also jumped up the uh, list of priorities. Um, we thought we would have a few bits and pieces of display items, um, but what we're going to end up with is, is a full on um, heritage attraction, almost, almost. Um, our workshop will remain at the heart of that. It will focus on boat building and traditional fishing skills um, and maritime uh, activities. Uh, um, and the, these will all be hands-on, uh, very much hands-on. So we'll continue um, with our programs for young people. We'll continue with our men's shed um, we will also um, start doing um, weekend residential type courses for people with an interest. And even at the end of lockdown, um, we are already getting people um, come, turning up in minibuses to hear about the heritage of um, Annan's boat building history or fishing or whatever it happens to be. Um, so without even trying, uh, we're already attracting visitors. Um, the other part of the jigsaw was something which had been mentioned once or twice, but came forward um, as a much more important means of um, producing income, and that's a bunkhouse. Uh, now, our building floods, <laughs> and so we're already a metre and a half off the ground um, on, on the ground floor um, before we started going upwards, and we thought we'd have three floors to work with, but in actual fact, we've only got two because of the flooding mitigation. Um, so to hand a big chunk of that over to um, a bunkhouse um, was going to be a big step for us. Um, well, the consultants were able to demonstrate um, and we were able to talk to other bunkhouses across the south of Scotland. Um, and we saw um, the success of some of these and we saw how many were actually in development and we realized that we could, if you like, be a pivotal place. Annan has got terrific um, 
communications connections. We're very close to uh, the motorway. We've got the A75 running right through and um, we've got rail network. So we could see us uh, ourselves um, as providing um, an active travel um, hub. Um, so that's, that's uh, going to be an integral part of, of, of what we're doing for the community. We're going to link in to uh, the various networks um, and um, a key part of that uh, then becomes the accommodation offering. Um, and the fact that people have already expressed interest in coming for residential courses um, sort of leads us to believe we've probably hit on, on, a, on a pretty good idea. Um, a bit more work has to be done now to test um, that thesis. Um, it's passed, if you like, it's passed land fund in that they've given us a grant to buy the properties. Uh, but we need to, um, for our own peace of mind and for other funders, we just need to check up on, on, on the viability of, of these things. Um, we're doing all of this alongside um, an application to Transport Scotland to, to uh, deliver a harbour revision order. Um, and we're very much in the hands of specialist solicitors for this. In fact, we're paying solicitors an eye-watering amount of money, um, courtesy of Dumfries and Gallery Council, um, who have asked us to do it because it's um, a lot cheaper than them trying to do it for themselves. Um, so we're now talking to the um, various stakeholders, the various interested bodies, and um, small harbours all the way around Scotland. Um, Annan will never be a marina with fancy yachts. It'll never be a destination um, for water sports, uh, but it's a fantastic amenity for the community as we've proven by um, taking people out in a variety of boats that we operate, um, rowing, sailing, power, um, and people um, really, really enjoy it. So um, our project thrust is to reconnect um, Annan with its heritage, reconnect Annan with its environment and reconnect Annan with its river, um, and that, that's proving successful. Getting the award from Scottish Land Fund um, for us is just the beginning because, as I said previously, the amount of money we need to, to um, get this building up and running is eye-watering, um, and so we need lots of help. So um, to do that, we're currently working up a prospectus so that we can take it to the people that are going to help us. Um, who we hope are the Dumfries and Gallery Council Regeneration Team, South Scotland Enterprise, uh, possibly even Borderlands. Um, we're going to need all of these um, guys on board. We need to sell them on the idea. Um, previous work has said that Anne and Ender performs um, um, as a visitor um, location. Um, we can help that in some small way. We project that we can get 12 to 15,000 visitors in town and every year um, and we can um, do quite a lot of bed nights um, via our bunkhouse. So our project um, can provide payback within 15 years, um, despite the fact we're going to spend millions. Um, so that um, Margaret touched on something which I thought was interesting and it was, she said, that they need to retain their charitable status. We need to do that too. But as a statutory organisation, a harbour authority, it, that's going to be challenging. So how that works um, is going to take quite a bit more thought and quite a bit of angst. Um, and it's mean considerable changes for our trustees who have worked tirelessly over 10 years. Um, we're going to have to bring in specialist um, trustees um, to run the harbour. And the action group activities, um, the youth activities, the community activities um, that, you know, are, if you like, have, have been our happy hunting ground up till now, um, will, 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 will have to happen under a slightly different umbrella. So again, um, that's consultation with Development Trust Association, uh, with other specialists, um, and no doubt by paying more solicitors, more sums of money, um, we'll need to change our constitution to accommodate where we're going in the future. Um, so all this, as I say, um, happened under lockdown and had the day job um, um, of running the workshop, 
been as full on as it usually is, we might not have been able to do it. So um, we're very pleased um, to be in the position of receiving an award from Scottish Land Fund. We're very grateful. We're very grateful to our consultants at High. Um, he talked us through this, held our hands through this process um, and got us to where we are. Um, and we're very um, grateful to the consultants who provided some great work and made us change our thinking. Um, but there's a heck of a lot of work ahead um, and we're looking forward to it. In the first instance, um, we have to do a lot more to reconnect back with our community and tell them what's happening and where we are. And hopefully um, they'll understand the decisions that have been made um, and help us um, with further good ideas going forward. Um, all of our ideas over the years have come from the community and we don't uh, presume to do their thinking for them. And they're not shy in telling us um, um, if, if they think we're not doing it correctly. And um, so we're looking forward um, to um, speaking to our community and uh, taking our project forward. And we'll let do you, Amy. Thank you, Alan. There's so much information from every speaker that we could have a separate session for everyone, I think. But I've seen your plans and they are very impressive and really looking forward to hopefully them coming to fruition. So thanks for sharing that, Alan. My okay, um, thanks everybody. Just to mention that we've got our Women and Land webinar um, on the 15th of December next week at 7.30. So please um, check out our website to book on that. And thank you for being with us today. And um, yeah, please send me any questions and we'll see you all again soon. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you everybody.